This footnote is about why I listed photography as one of my love languages. Um, because I did talk about this a little bit in the full episode, but I want to give some more information. Uh, one thing I mentioned was that I take photos at activist events. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah that's awesome. But my relationship with photography is kind of a, a lifelong love affair, so to speak, because, you know, when I was a kid, I, that, I grew up with a dark room in my basement because my my dad was really into photography and my granddad was really into photography as well. And my brother also does a lot of travel photography. So it it, it, it runs in the family. Oh, that's right? awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's something that we share in common. Even when I lived in, in Brooklyn, I had a I had a dark room in my basement. Which was which was quite a quite a privilege. Yeah, so like anyway. a dedicated room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it did flood once but that was that was uh, <laughs> it, that, that was a messy time but but we we all survived we all survived it was fine okay so there were some periods of time where i had considered photography as a career but i ended up taking different directions but even in my professional regardless of what i was doing work-wise i always did photography somewhere in the background I always still took my camera hmm. everywhere whenever I could. And then when I had my daughter seven years ago, <laughs> that typical parent thing happened where most of my photos were of her and her day-to-day -day <laughs> life because she's amazing and she's yeah. super cute and I couldn't take my eyes off of her, basically. She is very lovely. <laughs> yeah, it's genetic. <laughs> So I also wasn't shooting as much with my DSLR. I was mainly shooting with my phone, but I always, I buy my phone for the cameras. So I was still mm. getting good pictures. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, fast forward a bit, I started getting into photographing the local activist events partly as a way to have a more consistent role in these human rights activities. Because, uh, as you know, compassion fatigue is a thing. Hey, yeah, I wouldn't know anything um, about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I've, I've spoken at a lot of rallies. I think I probably shared with you my Black Lives, my first big Black Lives Matter rally that I spoke at, which was just absolutely epic that really got mm -hmm. me more passionate about being at these actions as often as I could. Yeah. Yep. So a lot of the rallies that I photograph are around refugee activism, um, for the various human rights abuses that Australia has committed to indigenous mm -hmm. people as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. So when yeah. some of the foreign wars that Australia has been complicit in have led to an influx of refugees, it's like the ongoing, the ongoing participation in those things is something that needs to be called out. So I, <laughs> so in the last couple of years with things that were happening in Iran and Afghanistan and, and Tigray and all these other places, these were things that were very important for me to engage in. Yep. But I, when I shoot, I use this really long lens, mm. right? It's a, it's a Sigma 50 to 500. It's basically the only lens that I've used to shoot anything for the past couple of oh. years. <laughs> yeah. Well, for, at, well, not, maybe 95% of the time. Mm-hmm. Mm. So because I've got this long, long <laughs> lens, lens, I have to be quite, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have to be, I have to be some distance away from someone to get a good shot of them. And this really yeah. works for me in that I get to capture these moments of raw, authentic emotion 
most when people don't know they're being photographed, <laughs> yeah. which in some ways might seem a little bit creepy, but you know, I have my ways of gauging when it is and is not appropriate to take a photo of someone. <laughs> yeah. And and with some of with some of the regular faces that you see at these rallies, you you come to know like who is open to being photographed and who is yeah. not. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But one of the one of the actions that I photographed a long time ago, well back in 2020, uh, well it was a series of actions for the the KP120 who are a group of refugees, refugee men who had been mm-hmm. held in offshore detention for years. A, yes. a long, long, long time. And they were moved into the city under the medevac legislation to receive medical care. So that was the idea, right? But what ended up happening was mm-hmm. that these guys were held in what was essentially an illegal prison at Kangaroo Point, right? Hence the KP yeah. in the KP-120. Now, for anyone who is not familiar with Brisbane geography, take a look at a map of Brisbane, find Kangaroo Point, and you will see that it is, it's in the middle of the city. It's not in some faraway yeah. place, <laughs> like mm-hmm. in, in the outback or anything like that. Like This was happening yeah. in the middle of the city, and there were still so many people who had no idea about it. Because, of course, the, the Murdoch press wasn't covering it in any meaningful way, mm-hmm. except to paint the protesters as, you know, these these pesky radicals who needed to get off of Centerlink and go get real jobs and all this and all that, which is just dumb. <laughs> that, that whole <laughs> argument about people protesting needing to just, like, not not having jobs, it's just so stupid. Partly because, first of all, no one runs down, runs around, you know, the mall in the in the middle of the week during the day, going, "All of you people need to go get jobs," <laughs> <laughs> when they're just out shopping or whatever. And but when people are out fighting for human rights, it's like, "Oh, you've got too much time on your hands." It's like, shut up. They also seem to be pretty happy coming and using that labor to serve them brunch on the weekends. But how do they have time off any mm-hmm. time else? yeah and it's also like yeah it's it's so silly i was just gonna say a lot of the people that come to mind in my life who have been involved in activism their whole life are professionals with high hour jobs Mm -hmm. and uh they still have Mm -hmm. that time yeah they make that time they use their time the spare time they have to fight for someone else's rights. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I love to capture in my photos. Yeah. The variety of people who attend these protests, it's not just one monolithic group of pests who are blocking traffic. No. You know? These are people, you know, they're moms and dads, they're grandparents, you know, there are people who are there are students. There are people pushing prams, there are people mm-hmm. with their with their little walking frames, people in wheelchairs, people of various ages, various backgrounds, various races, various levels of involvement in these different actions. Yeah. And this is something that is really important to me to capture in these pictures. Because there there's this feeling of like, oh, what's the point? That people sometimes bring to the conversations around political change mm. or social change. <laughs> They're like, oh, it's all, it's all so complicated. Why bother? Blah, blah, blah. And a lot of these people have never been to a protest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, okay, this is what protests actually look like. I have to admit, uh, I haven't been in too many marches or protests on the ground because I get super overwhelmed by the crowd and the noise and the stimulation. Mm. So I tend to try and find other ways to participate. 
Um, but mm. you've just been telling me about you're there, but you're photographing from a long way away. That sounds like a really nice way to participate in these things <laughs> without being in the middle of the crowd. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I kind of pop in and out of the crowd because if I'm photographing the person speaking mm. at, at, on the mic, for example, mm. but I like being more of a fly on the wall in this sort of sense, like more of an observer and reflecting yeah it, people's people back to themselves and it's funny how it overlaps with my coaching in that way because one of the things yeah that, yeah one of my favorite things is when i put my photos like on facebook or wherever and i share them with people or i share them with the organizers of these events and they start tagging each other in them. And someone will find a picture of themselves and they'll go, or and they'll use that picture as their profile picture, <laughs> which in some ways seems yeah. like such a small thing, but I absolutely love it. That is one of my favorite things. Partly because yeah. it's, it's, it's like they're saying, I, really appreciate what you saw in me when I didn't realize anyone was actually looking at me. And it's like this other level to yeah. that exchange. It's like, I saw you in this moment of raw passion, authenticity, fighting for something you believe in, sticking your neck out, facing possible judgment, facing possible mm -hmm. backlash, even just for being present. And you were friggin' beautiful. Yeah. And... To me, it's an act of love. Absolutely. It's something where I've seen photos of myself like that, where it captures part of my personality that never shows in posed photographs. Mm. And you very rarely see yourself like that. And I find it actually helps with the kind of dysmorphia that you often get with photographs of yourself where mm. you're just like, ooh, is that what I look like? Then you see a photo <laughs> of yourself expressing you where yes. you haven't put the filter on because you don't know mm -hmm. there's a camera there. And you're like, oh, that is me. And yeah. I like that person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it is a, a love language to be able to stand back and you use your time to capture that in other people, not just for them, but also for the movement as a whole. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the kind of thing that gets me like, like out of the house on a Sunday afternoon because like actions for Palestine, for example, that are still ongoing, like, look, it would be great to just hang out and, I don't know, play Scrabble with my kid. But there are some, there are things that need to be, there are stories that need to be told. And one way to tell those stories yep. is through the faces of the people who are expressing the emotions that fit with these tragedies mm. that are occurring in the world. And to me, it's also, it also helps me feel less, I guess, helpless. Helpless is kind of an icky word, mm. but that, that feeling can creep in from time to time. But staring, like literally staring at the faces of people who are also engaged in this fight, that's when I really feel a sense of shared humanity with people in my life. Mm. It's so much more important in those cases like the Israel-Palestine uh, war that there's such in... I, want, I don't want to say inaccurate, but there are very biased <laughs> views uh, in all sorts of media where you're just, like, not sure whose word can be taken, but if you can see the real people who are being affected, to me that's the yes. more um, the more reliable <laughs> source. Yeah, in a way that the Murdoch press isn't covering. Oh, never. Like, if they, in fact, I would say do as yeah. much as they can to to 
alienate and uh, dehumanize everyone as possible to <laughs> make sure yeah. that no one connects or feels just... any empathy. Yeah. That's why you need that connection to the human faces, the people who who have family over there right now <laughs> mm -hmm. and who have been fighting these and, and and in any of these human rights action these social justice movements that have been going on for generations like seeing the people who are actually being directly impacted and the people who are acting in solidarity with these people not just as mm -hmm. the keyboard warriors spouting off opinions and calling people pests but it's like no no no. <laughs> this is how we can address this this is what we've got we're just we're doing the best with what we've got yes <laughs> yeah our government needs to know what the people of their country actually think of this yeah. <laughs> of this situation when making their decisions because yeah. yeah we're the, gonna be involved some way or another one way or another yeah, and people who have ideas that don't gel with what they believe is a majority opinion need to see that, like, oh, yes, there are actual real live human beings who are, like, fighting for the side of what's actually right in this situation. But, yes, that's going yeah. down, like, a completely different discussion path. Yeah, I think so. let's so. just pull it back in. Um, so that's one short story one angle illustrating why photography is one of my key love languages because it mixes in with that advocacy as well mm -hmm. that's a bit about that thanks for listening yeah. mika thanks leslie <laughs> i love it <laughs> Bye. i love it <laughs> <laughs>